الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن أحسن قال من من ضاع إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إن لي من المسلمين رب شلي صدري ويصل لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني أفكر كولي I welcome all the viewers of the Peace TV Network, the Peace TV English, the Peace TV Urdu, the Peace TV Bangla, and the Peace TV Chinese, as well as the viewers on my four social media platforms, which are the Facebook, the YouTube, the Instagram, and Twitter. I welcome all the viewers to this program, Ask Dr. Zakir, to a new session, to a new season, that is season 5, session 1. Here you are most welcome to ask any questions on Islam or comparative religion. Or any question which a non-Muslim may have posed you and you were unable to reply. Or any question that you find on the media regarding Islam for which you require a reply, this is the opportunity. You can ask your question on any of the four social media platforms, but the best would be to ask your question as a message on the WhatsApp. You can mention your question in brief along with your name and profession as well as city and country of origin to the WhatsApp number plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero. I repeat, to the WhatsApp number, plus six zero, double one, two one, double three, double three, six zero. And this is a new season, that is season five, and session one. We'll first take the question from the WhatsApp. The first question is from Hasibul Kail. I am from Maharashtra, India. Dr. Zakir Naik, can you please tell me about a hadith in Sahih Bukhari, volume 7, hadith number 5686, about camel urine purity and impurity? Many non Muslims ask this question and I am unable to answer. A similar question is asked. I want to know about this hadith of Sayyid al-Bukhari 5686. Can we use camel urine with camel's milk as a medicine for cancer patients? As there is a research present on internet by Dr. Khurshid of Wing Abdul Aziz University that says this mixture can kill cancer cells. A similar question is asked also by Muhammad Ozer from Birmingham, UK. <coughs> Did the Prophet, peace be upon him, order Muslims to drink camel's urine? If yes, why do Muslims object to the Hindus when they drink cow's urine? Please explain. The question posed by these three questioners basically is that regarding the hadith of Sayyid Bukhari that the Prophet commanded some people to drink camel's urine, so is it correct, scientifically is it right, and what's the explanation? I had posted this hadith of Sahih Bukhari, volume 7, hadith number 5686, on my Facebook approximately three years back in 2017. And the moment I posted it, within a few hours, I got hundreds of comments. Some comments were okay, but some of the comments by Muslims it shocked me. They said, one of my fans said, Dr. Zakir, I was a great fan of yours, but now I read that you believe in a hadith in which the Prophet said you have to drink the camel's urine. How could you believe in such, such illogical things? And I'm really disheartened. And I'm no longer your fan. There's another Muslim who said that I've been following you. I thought you were scientific. 
you are logical how come you are posting such a hadith that the prophet commanded you have to drink camel's urine it's illogical and so on and so forth <clears throat> first i'd like to inform the muslims that for us muslims who believe that there is no god but allah and prophet muhammad peace be upon him is the messenger of allah for us our number one book of guidance is the glorious quran the glorious quran is the highest for us to follow it is higher than any other thing and number two is the authentic hadith and amongst them the next book after the book of allah the quran is the sahih bukhari if someone doesn't understand or it is difficult for him to understand the hadith or the verses of the quran there are ways of asking a muslim can ask me saying that i believe in the quran i believe in the hadith but can you prove to me logically how does this match with science i have got no problem or someone may ask me the question and many people did ask on my facebook that i am a believer in quran i believe it is correct but how can i explain this to other muslims whose iman is low or how can i explain this to the non muslims these type of questions are most welcome but to say that what is mentioned in sahih bukhari is wrong or what mentioned in quran is wrong because it doesn't match with science etc this is unlike of a practicing muslim so the guidance given in the quran in surah nahl chapter 16 verse 43 and surah anbiya chapter number 21 verse number 7 is fasalu ahl zikri in kuntum la ta'lamun if you don't know ask the person who is knowledgeable in that field but for you to disagree what the quran says or disagree with authentic hadith especially sahih bukhari it is unlike of a practicing muslim and later on i gave the answer on my facebook and alhamdulillah all these comments stopped but i was disappointed that some muslims they put quran and science and logic sorry they put science and logic higher than the quran for us muslims highest is the glorious quran followed by the authentic hadith especially hadith of sahih bukhari now what is the explanation that can be given we know after we do research that since several centuries ago and even according to recent research there are various researches which confirm that there are various benefits for the human being in drinking camel's urine according to ibn sina you might have heard the name of ibn sima heard the name of ibn sina the famous scientist muslim scientist who was given the nickname avicenna avicenna is more popular but his real name is ibn sina he writes he mentions in the book zad al mad that is four oblique 47 and 48 he says that amongst the urines the most beneficial is the urine of the bedouin camels and it is called as najib today after laboratory tests have been done on urine of the camel we have come to know that the camel's urine it contains potassium and albuminous proteins it also contains traces of uric acid and sodium as well as creatine if you go on the net there are various research is done umpteen i'll just mention a couple of them to you for your satisfaction according to the research done by dr abdul fatah mahmud idris he says that the urine of the camel has the urine of the camel can be used in treatments of certain skin diseases like tinea like ringworm like sores like abscesses dry and wet ulcers and scientific research has proven that camel's urine it makes the hair lustrous and thick and is also used in the prevention of dandruff there is another research available done by dr ahlam al awadi he is a microbiologist 
And after research, he says that camel's urine can be used as treatment for certain skin diseases like eczema, can be used for allergies, for sores, for burns, for acne, for nail infection. It can also be used as a treatment for hepatitis. And he also says that camel urine, it makes the hair stronger and thick and can be used as treatment for dandruff. There are various researches in scientific journals also. Time will not permit me to speak about many. I'll give you one more research done by Dr. Fatin uh, Abdurrahman Khurshid. And she has done research and she has proved that the camel's urine can be used in treatment of cancer and further it's mentioned in the journal of cancer science and therapy that camel's urine has got anti-cancer properties and can be used in the treatment of cancer and there are various scientific journals which have testified that camel urine can be used in treatments of skin diseases treatment of cancer and various other benefits are there in it. So for a Muslim without knowing and just saying that I cannot believe in it, it is wrong. What we have to do, you have to ask the person who knows. And irrespective whether the science has agreed with or not, what we have to do, if someone quotes a hadith, you have to first ask, is the hadith authentic? And if the hadith is authentic and say, as a Muslim, we believe in it. Amanna sadakna. If it's the verse of the Quran, we check it, it's part of the Quran, we believe in it. If it's a hadith, we verify whether it's authentic hadith, whether it's a say hadith, and we believe in it. Then later on, we can do research whether science has agreed with it or not. But science is not the criteria to identify whether we have to believe in the hadith or not. To identify the hadith has to be believed or not, we have to check its authenticity, and that was discussed by, by me. A few sessions earlier, how do we check the authenticity of hadith? So if a muhaddith has said a say hadith, we believe in it. Whether science agrees with it or not. But alhamdulillah, there is not a single verse in the Quran which has gone against any scientific fact. It may go against scientific hypothesis, but not a single verse of the Quran has gone against any established scientific fact, alhamdulillah. And I've given a talk on Quran and modern science which deals with it in great detail. Now coming to the third question, where the questioner asks that why if Muslims are mocking at the Hindus when they drink the camels, when they drink the cow's urine, then how can we agree with the hadith of the Prophet that we have to drink the urine of the camel? Point number one, let me tell you that Muslims should not mock at the Hindus just because they drink the urine of the camel. According to Ibn Sina, he says that the urine of the camel and the urine of the cow, it is not najis, it is tahir, it is pure. According to the fuqahas, according to Islamic scholars, they say that any animal for any animal which is permitted for a Muslim to eat, or any bird which is permitted for a Muslim to eat, that animal or that bird's urine and feces is tahir, it is pure, it is not najif. For example, if a pigeon lays a dropping and it falls onto your shoulder, on your clothes, then that part doesn't become najif, it is tahir. You can take it off, you can brush it off, if it dries, you can wash it, no problem, but it is not najif. Similarly, the urine and feces of all the animals which we are permitted to eat, whether it be goat, whether it be sheep, whether it be camel, whether it be cow, it is not najif. So based on this, according to the fuqahas, according to Islamic scholars, the urine of the cow is not najif. Regarding the claims made by Hindus that it has various medical benefits, etc., that is debatable. I went on the net and I tried to find out the benefits of the urine of the cow according to any scientific website I could not find any evidence. Yes, there are many Hindu websites which claims 
that there are so many medical benefits that can treat so many diseases, but it's not backed up with any proof. It's not backed up with any research which is authentic. It is just words. And drinking of camel's urine is coming down the ages for centuries. Like how drinking of camel's urine is coming down in the Muslim society, down the ages, for centuries. And it's a common practice in the Arab lands. Similarly, drinking camel's urine as is common. Drinking camel's urine is common in the Arab world. Drinking cow's urine is, cam is common amongst the Hindu culture. But there is no scientific proof at all that I could find. So I cannot say it is good or it is bad. But I can say according to Islamic scholars it is not Najis. Let me give an example. That during the election rally of the Prime Minister of my beloved country India, Narendra Modi, in 2014, before he came into power as the Prime Minister, in the election rally he said that our country India is so advanced, thousands of years before they did genetics. And he said what is mentioned in Mahabharata about Karna, he was born out of the womb of the mother. So imagine at that time, thousands of years before, human beings were, bound, were born outside the womb is because genetics was advanced thousands of years back. Then he goes on to say that what is mentioned about Ganesh, the elephant head god of the Hindus, also known as Ganpati, it's a body of a boy and head of an elephant. Prime Minister Narendra Modi says that at that time when an elephant head was put on a boy's body, it proves that there was cosmetic surgery at that time. Now these statements are laughable. No human being which has the knowledge of medical science will agree with such statements. If someone tells me it's a miracle of God, where they have done this, I've got no objection. But to say that cosmetic surgery was there thousands of years back, that's how an elephant head was put in the body of the boy. Even today, with the most advanced surgery, cosmetic surgery, you cannot implant, cut off the head of an elephant and put on a human body. It is illogical. For you to say it's a miracle of God, I will not object. For example, Quran says that Moses, peace be upon him. And even the Bible says that Moses parted the sea, peace be upon him. It's a miracle of God. I will believe in it. As the Quran says, as a punishment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala converted some human beings into apes, into pigs. No problem, that's a miracle. But to say that this means cosmetic surgery was there, it is a big joke. So such statements are made by politicians just for vote bank and to fool the ignorant citizens. This is objectionable. But we as Muslim, just because a non-Muslim drinks the urine of an animal, and especially when Afoka says that it is not Najis, we should not mock at them. Unless the scientific proof that it is harmful for the body and then we object, then we can take objection. But without proof, I believe we should not mock at the non-Muslims because we should know our deen very well first. And as far as reply to the non-Muslim regarding the urine and the benefits of urine of a camel, I've given the answer the various scientific benefits. So what our beloved Prophet Muhammad said has been proved to be correct now. This is based on the hadith of the Prophet of Sahih Bukhari, volume 7, hadith number 5686, where Anas Malabi said that when some people entered Medina, the climate of Medina did not suit them. So the Prophet told them, to go along with his shepherds, that is with, along with his camels, and drink the milk and the urine of the camel. A similar hadith is mentioned in Sayyid Bukhari, volume number 8, hadith number 6802, that some people from Ukl, from the Uraina tribe, they came to the Prophet and they accepted Islam. And the climate of Medina did not suit them. So the Prophet said, go to the herds of camel and drink the milk 
and the urine of the camel as a medicine. And they drank and they were cured and they became healthy. So based on this hadith of the Prophet which was mentioned about 1400 years ago, science has discovered a few hundred years before. Ibn Sina said that and even now that what the Prophet said 1400 years ago where medical science was in advanced. Today with the latest research we have come to know that whatever the Prophet said is correct today and today science tells us that besides treating various skin diseases the camel urine can also be used in the treatment of cancer. Hope that answers the question. <clears throat> the next question Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I hope you are doing well my respected Ustad I am Rizwan and I am a student from Andhra Pradesh India as you always quote the Quran chapter 3 verse 54 they planned and plotted Allah to plant Allah is the best of planners my question is, I think you know about recent incidents of Indian media. They all tried to defame you and wanted to keep you in jail, but now they are being defamed by everyone. Amongst them, Arnab Goswami was number one. Yesterday he went to jail. He told so many times that you should be in jail and now he is in jail. Did you pray to Allah for vengeance? May Allah grant you success in dunya and akhirah. Amin. The brother is talking about incidents where uh, we know that about four years back the Indian media maligned me and told me that I've been involved in terrorism, etc. And they spoke lies about me. And amongst them, one famous TV journalist, TV anchor person, his name is Arnab Goswami. And he is known to lie to fabricate just to increase his TRP. Normally, the role of a journalist is that he has got scruples, he has got values, and a good journalist will not change his view, even if it causes, he will stick to the truth, even if it causes loss to him, even if he has to lose money, he will stick to his principle. But Arnab Goswami, he was previously in Times Now, and then he started his own TV channel along with a BJP person, the Republic TV and he has broken all the rules of journalism. His main aim is to increase the TRP and while increasing the TRP he uses all sorts of lies, all sorts of illogical arguments and he is very good in speaking just to increase the TRP. He maligns people, he tells lies, so that it benefits his aims and objective. And that is known, that is the reason Indian media has been defamed in the international media. It is known to spread lies, etc. And he is a spokesperson of the Indian government BJP. Now, because there was a tussle between the Indian government, those who don't know the background, of India and Maharashtra. Maharashtra previously was ruled by a coalition government that is the ruling party BJP and the local party Shiv Sena. There was disagreement between them and they broke up and Shiv Sena joined with Congress, the other opposition and they formed a new government in Maharashtra. Now this Arnab Goswami who was a spokesperson of BJP started criticizing the present government and because of which the present government did investigation and they laid allegation that the TRP is rigged, etc. Whether right or wrong, Allah Alam. And then they arrested him in a case of abetment for suicide. Based on this, he was arrested and there was a big human cry all over India to the extent that many of the cabinet ministers 
of the central government. They spoke against the arrest to the extent that the Home Minister Amit Shah, number two of the country after Modi, he spoke against the Maharashtra government. How come they are arresting him? The broadcast minister spoke, information minister and various cabinet ministers. It was a big issue internationally that when someone is arrested and they are saying it is it is not correct, it is high-handedness, it is trying to block the freedom of speech. It is exactly a hypocrisy that there are hundreds of journalists who have been arrested by the same BGP government for criticizing them all over India. Now, when they arrest someone who they have proof against, they, they go out of the way to criticize and support him. So much so that he was arrested, he was put behind bars, he went to the High Court and the bail was rejected. When he went to Supreme Court, the bail was given and he was behind bars for one week, one full week. So the question is asking that I very often quote the verse of the Quran, where Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 54, makru Allah, wallahu khairu makrin. They planned and plotted, Allah to plan. Allah is the best of planner. So did I pray to Allah that because Annab Goswami said that I should be arrested and put behind bar and I am innocent, did I pray to Allah for vengeance? Believe me, I did not do that. I don't want to waste my prayers on such people. And if you heard my earlier answer, I in fact thanked the Prime Minister Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India, of my beloved country, because of his allegation I was forced to leave India and mashallah today I have come to a beautiful country Malaysia and my life in Malaysia is multiple times better. I had no intention, I have come to Malaysia many times, I never thought in my dreams also that I would be settling here. It is all thanks to Modi and because of him there are thousands and millions of Muslims who are praying for me Alhamdulillah. There are millions who have been abusing me but if someone abuses me wrongly according to Islam, all his good deeds will come to me and my bad deeds will go to him. That is the reason about two years back I thanked the Prime Minister of Modi and I would like to thank even Annab Goswami because of his TRP. He made me a scapegoat and he spoke lies against me because of which many of the Muslims may be praying for me, thousands of them. Many non-Muslims may be cursing me. In both ways I benefit. So regarding the question asked that did I pray to Allah for vengeance? No. If you know the history of a beloved Prophet Wasallam, there were two staunch enemies in the beginning of Islam and both of them were called Umar. A beloved Prophet Wasallam prayed to Allah that give Hidayah to one of the Umar. Among the Umarain, among the two Umar, give Hidayah to one and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Hidayah to Umar al-Khattab who became the second Caliph of Islam. May Allah be pleased with him. And when he accepted Islam, before accepting Islam, he was one of the staunchest enemy of Islam. But when he accepted Islam, he became one of the staunchest supporters of Islam. So I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may Allah give hidayah to Modi, may Allah give hidayah to Annab Goswami. Maybe after his trip to the jail of one week, he might have realized that many things may have come to his mind. And when he thought that he was untouchable, he thought that no one can touch him, no one can arrest him. Yet he was behind bars for one full week. 24 hours multiplied by 7. For one full week, for 7 days, he was behind bars. So we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may his eyes and his mind open up to the truth. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he defend the truth rather than defending falsehood just for the TRP. Because we should always stand for the truth and not just for our personal benefit. Hope that answers the question. <coughs> On the Facebook we have Muhammad Mazrul, Samira Jamal, Subhanallah, Lal Muhammad Ahmad Zai, Muhammad 
اتھر فاروقی السلام علیکم ذاکر نائک محمد عمران خورشید احمد السلام علیکم وعلیکم السلام ولی پختن زویا اللہ فرام افغانستان محمد سلفی ماشاء اللہ نور اللہ حبیبی ہائے زنت شاہ واشنگ فرام بلرام پور محمد انساری وین ویل یو کم ٹو انڈیا انشاء اللہ وین ایور اللہ ولس شہاب الدین ساکی پیپل آف بنگلہ دیش لائک یو سو مچ آئی لاف یو ٹو مبارک اسماعیل نما لانگ لیف شیخ زاکر نائک محمد عرفان ماشاء اللہ تحیر الدین میاں ماشاء اللہ فیاد حاتیہ سلام علیکم ڈاکٹر زاکر محمد وعلیکم السلام محمد احمد صوبج دی گفٹس آف اللہ فور دی مسلم کمیونٹی حماسہ ہلال بطول واشنگ فرام پاکستان عبد الکریم زواہر حبیب I love you so much I love you too Najia Hamid I have many questions but I don't know where to put it you can put you can ask your question the best is as a whatsapp message ask your question in short mentioning your name your profession and the city and country of origin to the whatsapp number plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero I repeat plus six zero ڈبل ون ٹو ون ڈبل تھری ڈبل تھری سکس زیرو ان دو یوٹیوب وسائی امتیاز انیک عرفان شمنا ختیجہ مشتہ ومپخس درشیک عبدالگفار نفیہ سعید شاہد خان لرننگ اسلام Siddhartu Ato, Anik Irfan, Hazoi, Sajid Spam, Muhammad Shaheen Ahmed, I love you Zakir Naik, I love you too. Muhammad Riyaz, Muhammad Farhan, Muhammad Ajan, Muhammad Dastakhi, Abdul Ghaffar, Robi Ravan, لولو سلال راد شرار واسے امتیاز مینی پیپل آر ڈوئنگ دعاز آئی ڈو دعاز فور یو چو السلام علیکم والیکم السلام The next question, Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam. I am Abdullah Al Mahmood, pseudonym, from Dhaka in Bangladesh. I am a final year student of honors class. Pseudonym means a false name, and I do appreciate that whenever you're asking questions which are sensitive and involves a person have done sin, I would prefer that you give a pseudonym, a false name, or you do not mention your name. We don't want to publicize to the public the name of the person who has committed sins, etc. So it's good that the brother has given a pseudonym or you avoid mentioning a name to questions which are sensitive and involves where a person has done major sins, etc. So the question is, I like a girl and send her family a proposal of marriage from my family. As far as I know, she is a pious girl. When the girl found out about me after sending the offer, she told me about a mistake that she had happened, a mistake that had happened in her life. That is, she was forced to commit adultery at some point despite her reluctance. Later, when she realized the mistake, she felt ashamed, she repented and did toba. 
She could have kept the matter a secret from me if she wanted to, but she did not. Alhamdulillah, she is, our, she is righteous now. She further added that this is entirely my wish, whether I would agree to the marriage even after learning about her past. I want to get married for her righteousness without looking at her mistakes, inshallah. Would it be right for me to marry her in this situation? <clears throat> the question posed by the brother from Bangladesh is that he gave a proposal to a girl who he thought was righteous and then she said that she made a mistake and she has committed fornication, she had done zina and now she has repented and she wants to let her mistake be known by the boy and yet if she agrees to marry her she is willing and the boy feels that the girl is righteous and she wants to marry so islamically is it permissible for a muslim boy or a muslim man to marry a girl who has committed fornication the quran says in surah nur chapter number 24 verse number 26 that women impure are for men impure. Men impure are for women impure. And the verse continues. Women of purity are for men of purity. Men of purity are for women of purity. <clears throat> Further, it's also mentioned in the Quran. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 3. That as to those who have committed fornication or adultery they should not marry any woman unless she has done the same sin or an unbeliever and similarly a woman cannot marry a woman who has done adultery should not marry a man unless he's done the same sin and for a believer this is forbidden so the quran is very clear cut in surah nur chapter number 24 verse number 26 that impure women are for impure men, impure men are for impure women, pure women are for pure men, and pure men are for pure women. And it's mentioned in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 3. That a man who commits zina, adultery or fornication, cannot marry a Muslim woman unless she has done the same sin, zina or adultery. Or he can marry a mushirka, a non-believer. Similarly, a woman who has done the sin of zina or adultery cannot marry a man unless he's done the same sin of zina or adultery or a mushrika. And for a believer, that is forbidden. So based on this verse, is it permitted for a Muslim man to marry a girl who has committed the sin of fornication after she has told that she is a fornicatress? According to Ibn Qatir, if you read the commentary of this verse, he says that Ahmed ibn Ambal, may Allah have mercy on him, he said that for a woman who has committed fornication or adultery, it is not permitted for that woman to marry a man unless that man has done fornication or adultery. It is not permitted for her to marry a man who has not done adultery or fornication. Similarly, for a man, who's done fornication or adultery, it's not permitted for him to marry a woman who's not done adultery or fornication. Unless she has done that, it's permitted. Or they can marry a non-believer or mushrika. But Ahmed ibn Hanbal, may Allah have mercy on him. He says, but if that woman who has committed adultery or fornication, or if that man who has committed adultery or fornication, if he or she repents, then they are no longer fornicators. If they repent sincerely, inshallah Allah will forgive and they no longer are called as fornicators and fornicators. In this case, if a woman who does fornication repents, then it's permitted for her to marry a Muslim man who is pure, who has not done fornication or adultery. Similarly, if a man who has done fornication or adultery, if he repents and asks for forgiveness, Inshallah Allah will forgive, then after forgiving, 
after asking for forgiveness, after repenting, he can marry a pious Muslim woman. It is permitted. But without repenting, if a man or a woman who has done fornication or adultery marries a pious man or woman, that marriage is invalid. It will be called a zina. And if someone marries without repenting to a man or a woman who is pious, it is not valid. Then what can be done? They should repent and again remarry. So if a woman or a man has done fornication and has married a man or a woman who is pious, without repenting, the marriage is not valid. What they should do? They should repent and then remarry. But if they feel it is difficult, like a woman has done fornication and without repenting she married and then she realized a mistake and if she feels it's not possible now that she can tell the husband that she was involved in fornication and now she has repented the earlier marriage was not correct and now will she marry again or if people will come to know so in, in uh, cases where your major sin will be exposed and maybe the husband may not accept or the husband may not be comfortable or the husband may accept and may yet keep a grudge so in such cases if the mistake is done they should continue the marriage and ask Allah for further forgiveness inshallah Allah will forgive as far as this questioner has posed the question that he proposed to a girl who she thought was pious and righteous and she agreed that she has done fornication before marriage she has repented but yet he feels that she is pious no wonder she told him the sin can he marry if she has repented it is permitted to marry but my advice to you would be that if you marry you should be crystal clear that yes she was a girl who did fornication and you have also forgiven her you should not keep that in your mind if that is going to be kept in your mind then there may be unhealthy family relationship afterwards so if you have that courage and that forgiving nature, that knowing the girl you think is pious, but she made a mistake, you'll forgive and you'll not bring it up later in the life, then I say no problem, you can marry. And of course, she has said that she has repented, she has asked for forgiveness, inshallah I'll forgive. But let me tell you that keep in mind that don't repeat that to her. And don't keep it that, keep that in your mind that she is a girl who has done fornication, otherwise the husband-wife relationship would be hampered. So if you have that heart or the courage to do it, then inshallah you can go ahead and you can marry her and inshallah pray to Allah that may this marriage be successful. The next question. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Naseem from India. My question is relating to halal investment entities like Tata Ethical Fund. Yes, I understand the part where they don't invest in entities dealing with alcohol, gambling, etc. However, they still invest in entities involved in interest, although immaterial but still interest is involved what is the ruling can i as a person use the platform of tata ethical fund to make investments also years back to a reply to someone asking you about stock market part of your answer mentioned that you yourself invested in the stock market so how can the youth start investing in stock market in halal way a similar question is asked by another questioner. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Shafi Sheikh. I am from London, UK. Is it permissible to invest in shares or stock market? Both the questioners have basically asked the question that is it permitted to invest in shares or stock market? And the first question asked that can we invest in Tata Ethical Fund? I also invested in it and I was involved in stock market. First, I'll discuss regarding is it permissible? to invest in share or stock market. It is like someone asking me a question, is it permitted for me to eat food? And the simple answer is yes, you can eat food which is halal. You can eat food 
which is area compliant. Then you can go into the details that, okay, the foods which are prohibited, you should stay away from it. You cannot have alcohol, you cannot have pork, you cannot have animals which have got canine teeth, which are non-vegetarian and so on and so forth. Among the animals which are permitted are the cattle, which are herbivorous, but you should see to it that they are done. Zabia and there are various rules and regulation. If all the rules and regulation of food is followed, then that food becomes halal or sharia compliant. If that food is not matching the rules and regulation that are laid down by the Quran and say hadith, then that food becomes haram. Similarly, regarding the question, can you invest in shares or stock market? I will say, if the share or stock market is halal, if it's Sharia compliant, you can invest it. If it's not Sharia compliant, you cannot invest. But naturally, as far as food is concerned, most of the Muslims are aware about the do's and don'ts of the food. So it's easy for a normal Muslim to identify the halal food. And if there are difficulties, mashallah, there are stamps put in different parts of the world, in many of the Muslim countries, the halal mark is there. Now regarding investing in stock, it's the same. We cannot invest in any stock. You can only invest in Sharia compliant stocks or Sharia compliant shares. This field of Islamic finance and the stock market is vast. You can speak on it for hours. I will try and give you in summary brief points how to come to know whether the share is Sharia compliant or not. But it will be difficult for a layman to grasp. But yet I will tell in brief, in short, to the best of my ability. There are basically five criteria for any share or for you to invest in any stock for it to be Sharia compliant. Number one, the core activity or the main activity of that company whose share you are buying should be halal. It should not involve in haram activity. For example, you cannot buy share of an alcohol company. You cannot buy share of a company which is dealing in pork, a company which is dealing in, in uh, gambling, where the core activity is, for example, having a casino. You cannot invest in share of a company which deals with pornography. So if the core activity is alcohol or dealing with pork or gambling or or pornography, it is haram. Or if it is directly or indirectly involved in interest. So you cannot be share of a conventional bank which is based on interest or riba. You cannot buy shares of company of insurance which are based on riba. So any financial institution which is connected with riba or with interest it is prohibited. So if the core activity of the company is haram, then you are not allowed to buy shares of that company. If it is not haram, if it is halal, then you, you pass the first criteria. The second criteria is that besides the core activity, if the other activities of the company, it may not be the major activity, if it is involved in haram, it should not be more than 33%. For example, if the total asset value of the company is 100 million dollars and if they have put 5 million dollar into a fixed deposit which gets them interest. So 5 million out of 100 million is 5%. So the scholars they say that up to 33% it is permitted. If it is less than one third it is permitted. If more than one third, more than 33% in that company, you cannot invest. It becomes haram. Now, there are different, this is, this rule I'm mentioning is by Mufti Taqi Usmani. And Mufti Taqi Usmani, alhamdulillah, is from Pakistan. He is one of the greatest person in the field of Islamic finance, as well as Dr. Hamid Hussein Hassan. Dr. Hamid Hussein Hassan, he expired recently, just a few months back. He is also known as the father of Islamic banking, father of Islamic finance. These two persons, mashallah, are the two great personalities as far as Islamic finance and Islamic banking is concerned. 
So Mufti Taqi Usmani has put that if the haram activity of that company is less than 33%, it is permitted to invest in that. Some have put 30%, some have put lesser, have put 25%. It depends upon your own taqwa, you can keep as low as possible, but some, most of the scholars say up to 33% accepted, some which are stricter say it should be less. And when I discussed with Dr. Hamid Hussain I said that I want it to be less than 10%. He said, very well, you can do it. Besides this, the earning from that haram investment should not be more than 5% of the gross revenue. For example, out of $100 million, $5 million you have put in the fixed deposit, you are getting interest, but the income is a small percentage, maybe 1% of your total gross revenue. So the income from that haram activity should not be more than 5% of the gross revenue, then you can invest in that company. So the first criteria is that the basic core activity, the main business of the company should be halal. Number two, that if there are associate activities, which are not the main activities, it should be less than 33% of the total investment in the haram activity and the revenue from that haram should not be more than 5% of a gross revenue. This is the second criteria. The third criteria is that if that company has taken a loan on interest, then they cannot take a loan of more than 33% of their total asset. That means that if they take loan, suppose the company has an asset of $100 million, if they take a loan of $5 million, accept it ten, up to $33 million, it's accepted. If it's more than 33% of the total asset, it's not accepted and you cannot invest in that company. So the debt ratio, the cash debt ratio to the total asset should be less than 33%. Again, this 33% has been laid down by Mufti Taki Usmani and he has said this. But some scholars have put 30%, some have put 25%. When I invest, I see to it that it is less than 10%. I am more stricter. But I am not saying that someone invest in 20% in a company which has 20% debt ratio to the asset, it is haram. No, it is, depends on each one's taqwa. The scholars have said up to 30 percent, that's fine, but I want to be more strict. So third criteria is that the debt ratio, the loan they have taken on interest, if it's a loan given by the partners, by the shareholders, interest-free, then that is not called as a debt on interest. It should be based on interest. If it's taken from an Islamic bank, which is Sharia compliant, that is accepted. That's not counted as haram, it's counted as halal. The fourth criteria is that the illiquid asset, illiquid asset means the asset which is not liquid, it's not cash, but it can be converted into cash by selling. For example, property, for example, equipment, for example, goods. So this is called as illiquid asset, the property, the equipment can be the machinery, can be the furniture. They can be sold, you may not get the exact value, but somewhere close to it, you, it can be sold. So these are called illiquid asset. According to most of the scholars, the illiquid asset should be more than 50%. Because you cannot have a company which only has 100% cash. I have $100 million, now you invest. So if it's $100 million, it will be at par. You cannot charge more or charge less. If you charge less, that will be called riba. So, for example, if you pay $100 and say that I get a box in which is $120, that's riba. If you're paying $100, you can either get $100 or maybe something else, or box with $100, the box has a value, but you cannot have, get $120. So, in this, if you're investing, the most of the scholars say majority, more than 50% should be illiquid asset. Some of the scholars say even 33% is accepted. That means it is you are investing in a company which has got cash, also illiquid asset, 
it uh, may be the brand value or maybe the asset or maybe the furniture maybe the property real estate according to the hanafi fiqh there is no percentage laid down as long as it's a mixture of illiquid and liquid asset you can invest but mufti taqi usmani says it should be minimum 20 percent that means the illiquid asset should be minimum 20 percent you can't have a company which only has cash so that will be at par value so you cannot invest in that it will be same you cannot give a value less than that it will be riba so mufti taqi usmani puts it at 20 percent minimum should be the illiquid asset but most of the scholars said say it should be more than 50 percent because there's a general ruling on sharia that the majority is counted as and the majority is counted as a whole so more than 50 percent are illiquid you count whole as an illiquid and that's better to do business in it's better to buy shares of that but some scholars put a 33 percent mufti takius money has gone down to 20 percent but majority scholars say it should be more than 50 percent that is the fourth criteria and the fifth criteria is that the total liquid illiquid asset put together or the total asset minus the liability should be less than the market value your total asset minus the liability cannot be more than the market capitalization that will not be permitted so you have to take out the total value and the market capitalization that you're doing should be more it cannot be less if it's less it becomes not sharia compliant the total value that you have of your liquid asset of your cash of your asset everything put together minus the liability what market capitalization you have it should be less than that it's accepted if it's more it's not accepted so these basically are the five criteria which you look into before buying the share and if you are not well versed with the finance aspect it's difficult for a layman to try and find out whether sharia compliant or not but if you do research find or best would be to ask a consultant first allo al zikri in gundula talamun as the if you don't know as the person who knowledgeable but these are the basic five criteria and you can speak in detail in each criteria you can go into detail and find out so generally yes it is permitted for a muslim to invest in sharia compliant share if all the five criteria which i mentioned if it follows and agrees with all the five criteria number one the core activity should be halal it should not be haram it should not be dealing with alcohol pork gambling pornography an interest based company a bank interest based bank etc number two is that its other activities if haram should be less than one third lower the better i would say less than 10 percent the profit gain from the haram activity should be less than five percent of the gross revenue i would say much less the better third is that if they take a loan on interest that company it should be less than 33 percent i would say less than 10 percent but 33 percent is accepted number four is that the illiquid asset should be more than 51 percent the Mufti Taki Usmani says up to 20%, you can accept that. But if it's more than 51%, it is more than 50%, it is better. And the last is that the total asset value, liquid liquid put together minus the liability, should be less than the market capitalization. If this is accepted, you can invest in that company. But let me tell you one thing. This we are talking about investing in share. Share means there may be 1,000 shareholders or 10,000 shareholders. You are a small shareholder. But... If you are a shareholder, it is compulsory that you object to part two. If in the second criteria, there is some haram activity involved, for example, out of $100 million, $5 million they have invested and kept it in a bank as a fixed deposit. So you as a shareholder should object either in writing or verbally in the annual general meeting. If you don't do, it is haram. Now, your share will not have value. That's a different thing. You may be holding 0.001% of the share holding, or maybe 1%, or maybe 2%, or maybe 5%. You have to object to the haram investment, whether it's 1%, 10%, 5%, number one. Number two, even the haram income that comes, you have to object. But since you are small, they may not follow your objection, but 
you have done your duty number one object to the haram investment number two object to the haram profit number three when you get your dividend if you know that the haram activity is two percent of the revenue gross profit what do you have to do you have to purify your dividend and remove two percent as haram activity there are two types of purification one is purification only of the dividend which all the scholars say should be done some scholars which are most strict they say there should be purification even of the principal amount of the share I mean what the share one is the dividend you have to purify also the main cost the NAV of the share if it rises you bought for maybe ten dollars now it is fifteen dollars so that fifteen dollar is because of some haram activity also I believe that let's be safe and besides purifying the dividend you have to try and find out see the balance sheet how much is the haram activity what is the percentage with the two percent three percent four percent remove that from the dividend percentage and second also remove it from the cost of the share the best way is to try and find out what is the interest rate that the company has when they invest etc that rate can safely be said as that portion is purification and secondly that you have to even give zakat on the share the difference of opinion how zakat is calculated the best is you have to see the balance sheet and try and find out which activity uh, zakat has to be given some doesn't have to be given so those activity with zakat has to be given you give zakat on that you calculate on the balance sheet others you need not if it's difficult scholars even say give 40 percent zakat so it's 100 dollar share the 40 percent is zakat applicable so you give two and a half percent of 40 dollars so you give one dollar per share so if it's 100 dollar share average you can take out 40 percent so forty dollar, two and a half percent of forty dollars, one dollar. So one hundred dollar share, you pay one dollar. But if you can really calculate and come to know, okay, only twenty percent of the value of the share is zakatable, that in which you have to pay zakat. Pay twenty percent of hundred dollar is twenty dollar. Two and a half percent of twenty dollar, you can pay. This is regarding investing in share. But let me tell you, this does not mean that if you are running a company, it is permitted for you. This criteria only if you are investing as a Muslim in a company which is not totally Sharia compliant. If you are running a company, okay, core activity is should be halal. You have done that, but you say, okay, fine, I will take maybe ten percent, you know, loan from the bank. You as a Muslim running a company, which is the boss of the company, you can not even take point zero one percent, point zero one percent as interest. It's haram. Even taking one dollar on interest is haram. So you cannot say that, oh, now in, in while buying shares, 33% debt ratio is allowed. That is because you don't have control over the company. But if you are the boss of the company or you are the major shareholder of the company, in no way can you involve even in 0.001% haram activity. You cannot. You cannot say, okay, income up to 5% is allowed, so I will take income up to 3%, 4%. No. This is for a company which is not Sharia compliant. 100% and that way you are a small shareholder this is what the FUKA has said that up to 33% allowed I say up to 10% up to 5% haram is there you take it out and you purify if you are the boss you cannot do this you cannot involve even in 0.1% haram activity now 0.1% haram income neither can you take loan from the bank which is which is interest based Sharia compliant bank yes you can so the second and third criteria when you are running a business yourself you cannot involve in any haram activity this is only because you are a small shareholder in a big company coming to the question the first question I said that can you invest in Tata Ethical Fund now Tata Ethical Fund is a fund which was launched maybe about 15-20 years back I think it was in somewhere close to 90s in the late 90s that's about uh, more than 20 years back it was a fund launched by the Tata company which is a Parsi company and what they did that they were targeting Muslims and Jains so they followed 
the religious principles of Muslims and Jain and they launched a fund, not very big, it was 25 crores, at that time maybe more than 5 million dollars, they launched the fund, the total value was not very big. And they said they will follow all the principles and they were careful. And even I invested, but what we did, we personally checked whether the investment was Sharia compliant or not. At that time when I invested, it was Sharia compliant. The negative factor of Tata Ethical Fund was they did not have a Sharia board. Because they are non-Muslim, they may not be aware of the Sharia and they may think it's Sharia compliant, it may not be. So we as the investor, we used to check ourselves. At that time when I invested, it was Sharia compliant. But investing in such fund which does not have a Sharia board is not very safe. Unless you yourself have enough knowledge. The best for a Muslim is that you, can, you should invest in a Sharia compliant fund. A Sharia compliant company is one company. Mutual fund, there is a fund manager which invests in various shares of different companies. And does not invest in one company only. There's a rule you cannot invest more than 20% in one company. Some fund have a rule not more than 25% in one company. So they divide the risk. So the chances of loss is less. But if it's a Sharia compliant fund manager, who's a Muslim knowing the Sharia law is the best. But if you go to a non-Sharia compliant like Tata Ethical didn't have a Sharia board. So we requested them that they should have a Sharia board. They said, okay, we will think over it and all. But at that time, I don't know what happened after that. But by nature, there are certain UTF fund, Unit Trust of India, mutual fund. By nature, they are Sharia compliant. That means the core activity is halal. It may be pharmaceuticals, it's halal. But what then you have to do, you have to see the balance sheet and see to it that the second and third criteria is within your level. The first is passed, core activity is okay, pharmaceutical. It's halal. But see to it that they don't keep too much, you know, sometimes when the market goes up and down, they may keep too much money. So what in this non-Sharia compliant funds, it may be Sharia compliant for one time. If the market fluctuates, the safest thing is, okay, put in the bank. So when they put in the bank, more than one third then becomes non-Sharia compliant. So it is safer to put in a fully mutual fund which has a Sharia board or invest in a company which has a Sharia board. That is the safest. But otherwise also you can invest in normal companies if you know the nature or you see the track history or ask an expert. An expert will tell you, this company it's a Fortune 100 company, it will not go, it will always be Sharia compliant because of its basic principles. That okay, core activity is halal, it's not interesting loan and this aspect that you should not take more than one third loan, it is a normal fund manager, this is a thumb rule even for non-Muslims. According to Benjamin Graham, who was one of the best expert investors of the 20th century, his student is Warren Buffett, he said, don't invest in a company which has more than 33% of debt. Means if it has more than one third debt, so this is the normal rule of a finance manager. Because it's Islamic. So less the debt, more healthy the company. And most of the 100, top 100 finance, the top companies don't have debt. Um, if they have, they have a small level. So if you're investing in company which are not Muslim, which are not Sharia compliant, depending upon the base, so you ask an expert and he will tell you these companies will always remain Sharia compliant or these companies mostly Sharia compliant but may become un -sharia com may not become Sharia compliant because of certain activities. If you know this fine or best is to invest in a Sharia compliant mutual fund, it is safe but be careful there are some Muslims launching Sharia compliant funds and they have cheated the Muslim Ummah, so you have to be careful. You have many in India, I don't want to name them. You have many all over the world. They launch in the name of Islam, saying Sharia compliant, and they deceive most of the Muslims. So really you have to see who is the chairman of the Sharia board. If you know the chairman of the Sharia board is the authentic Muslim scholar, no problem. Most of these, many of the Islamic mutual fund don't have, they just have namesake Muslim Sharia board. Not people who are well reputed, etc. But if you have a well reputed person on the board like Dr. Hamid Hussain Hassan or, or like Mufti Taki Usmani, so then you can safely invest in these companies and they will follow the Sharia 
compliance. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Umme Maryam. I live in Dubai. According to you, which is the best place to live on this earth as a Muslim? Where we can practice our deen and our kids get the best values. Jazakallah khair. May Allah protect you and your family always. Ameen. The sister has asked a very important question and a very difficult question that which place according to me today is the best place where a Muslim can live, which place, which country, which city a person can live and follow the deen and can bring up his children etc. But naturally without doubt the two best places in the world are the Harmain that is Makkah and Medina. And we know these two are the holy cities, you know, of Islam. So they are the best without doubt. And a beloved Prophet Muhammad said, Hadith of Ibn Majah, volume number two, hadith number 1406, that the beloved Prophet said that anyone who prays in my mosque, he'll get 1000 times more reward than prayer in any other mosque except the sacred mosque talking about Makkah the Masjid al Haram in Makkah for in the sacred mosque you will get 100,000 times more sawa so if you pray in Masjid al Nabwi it is 1,000 times sawa in Haram in Makkah you get 100,000 times sawa so these two are the two holiest mosques and scholars differ regarding what does it mean by praying in the haram? Does it mean praying only in the mosque or does it mean in the full hudud, the full haram area? The Makkah city is hudud, is the haram. So some scholars say it's only in the mosque, some scholars say no, it is in the full haram. Like some scholars, like Ibn Taymi, may Allah have mercy on him, it says only in the mosque. There are other scholars like Sheikh bin Baz and many of the Hanafi Fuqahas, the Shafi, the Maliki, they say no, it means the full haram, anywhere in the city. But irrespective whether you get 100,000 times sawab or not, it is understood that the whole haram is much more pure than other parts of the non-haram. Similarly, Medina. So the best city in the world is Makkah, second is Medina. Both of them, they are the best. But I'm sure that the questioner doesn't want this answer, they want an answer otherwise. It's not possible for all the Muslims to go and live in Makkah, Medina. She wants an answer which is other than the Harmi. If the sister would have asked this question to me maybe about 10 years back, I would be in a better position to reply. But now, you know, in the last 5 to 10 years, the political situation has changed so much, especially in the Muslim majority countries, that previously I could say that, I mean, but naturally, for sure, there's no country in the world which is following 100% of the Islamic Sharia. There's no country in the world that I know of today or 10 years back or 20 years back or 30 years back, which was following 100% of the Sharia of the Quran, the Sayyid. That was the time of the Prophet at the time of Khulfa Rashid. In Alhamdulillah, it was the best time. Now, no country. But if you had asked me this question 10 years back, I would say though no country is 100% Islam, who's following 100% Islam, but we can say is following majority. Majority means more than 50%. I could name maybe one or two at least if not more. But now 
especially in the last five to ten years, the political scenario has changed so much that unfortunately I cannot tell you a single Muslim country which is even following majority. Those countries which were maybe 10 years back, though not 100%, can say more than 51% safely. Whether it's 55% or 60% or 70% or 80%, that is debatable. But safely, most of the Muslims could say more than 50%. But today, even that I cannot say. Since the sister asked the question, today which is the best place for a Muslim to live so that he can practice Islam, etc. Let me tell you that if an individual Muslim wants to practice Islam in any part of the world, it's possible. That's a different scenario. But which place is the best, easily convenient, where a person can be on the deen? Let me tell you for sure that it is not the Western countries. There are many Muslims who have migrated to Western countries thinking you have good life, yes, you may get good money, but that is totally wrong. I would never count Western countries as anywhere close to being a good place for Muslims to live. And according to the glorious Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 97, when the angel of death comes to take the life of those people, the soul of those people who have sinned, and ask that how were you? They will say we were weak and oppressed. So the reply would come, then isn't the earth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spacious enough for you to migrate? So based on this, majority of the scholars say it is not right for a Muslim to live in a non-Muslim country. Number one, according to this verse, and the verse continues that those who have the ability should migrate if he's living in a place where majority are mushriks or unless if he's weak or if he's a womb or if she's a woman or they cannot migrate they have difficulties then inshallah they should ask forgiveness allah will forgive so this reply i have given in detail in my earlier question maybe one or two months back is it permissible for muslims to migrate to non-muslim countries western countries and i said totally wrong if a Muslim is living there, it is best he should migrate to a Muslim country or a Muslim majority country, number one. If that non-Muslim country is a country where you can practice your deen safely and freely without any problem, then the fuqaha says it is permissible but yet makhru. Permissible but makhru. But tell you frankly, I don't know of any such country in the world. Any western country in the world where you can openly practice your deen and say you are safe. Certain aspects, yes. So those people who may try and give you a view that in this uh, Western country, whether it be America, whether it be Europe, whether it be UK, I can practice my deen freely, they are lying. Yes, certain parts you can, not totally. And certain cities or certain countries, it's much more easier than other parts, yes. But as a whole, 100% no. There may be some people who go to Western country and have become more Islamic. That is Allah's plan, Alhamdulillah. That's Allah's will. That doesn't mean it is better. According to the Islamic Sharia, according to most of the scholars, you should, a Muslim should not live in, in a country which has majority non-Muslims. Best is migrate. Unless if that country he can practice freely, then becomes makru, it's not the best. Or if you're weak and you cannot migrate. And I've given the answer in detail. I don't want to go in that. So number one is surely it cannot be a country in which majority are non-Muslims. There are some exceptions where India. India was a country that was ruled by Muslims for more than a thousand years. And it had approximately 40% Muslims. Then the Britishers came, they had partition, one third went to Pakistan, one third Bangladesh, one third remained. So now it is approximately 15-16%. It has become a minority, but yet the country has Muslim personal law. And there are some other countries like, like Singapore which has a Muslim personal law. So if a non-Muslim country which has a Muslim personal law, then okay, that means legally you are allowed to follow Islam. And there are very few and none of the Western countries that I know which has a Muslim personal law. So in which a non-Muslim Western country a majority non-Muslim Western country, I don't know any. 
this alhamdulillah india is exception as i told you it was ruled by muslims so they will not fall under, under that category where you have to migrate and i have given their answer also in detail so coming to the questioner surely it cannot be a muslim majority country but recently even india after the bjp came to power it deteriorated before that i would say it is safe you could practice islam freely you had the rights today also in the constitution the muslims have a right to live and they have the security bus but the present government the bjp government of prime minister narendra modi is attacking muslim they are not giving them the rights so now it's a problem for muslims to live in india but maybe 7 8 years back it was safe most of the parts of india were safe now after bjp has come most of the parts of india are unsafe and similar in singapore it's not the same as before the rules are changing so coming back to it surely that country has to be a muslim majority country and today there are approximately 57 countries which have muslim majority population and when i was forced to do hijra i had to leave the country i myself did a survey which is the best country to live in and alhamdulillah there were more than 10 countries most of the muslim majority country who offered me and told me you can come and live here we'll give you citizenship etc etc but i was in no hurry i took my time i did my survey and i chose amongst all the countries in the world amongst more than 200 countries in the world amongst 57 muslim majority country i would say the best of the worst muslim country or to put it in a better way the best available muslim country for me to live in it was malaysia and alhamdulillah i will give you the reasons why i said that so as far as i am concerned as a dai who wants to propagate islam who wants to preach islam who want the freedom to practice islam and preach it without fear of being silenced the best amongst all the muslim available country is malaysia there are other muslim countries which are more in majority but may not be comfortable for me as a dai it may be comfortable for some other muslims who are not preaching islam who are not involved in dawa but as i told you according to the quran the best profession is for dai so if a dai is not comfortable you can be sure that that country is not following islam in total if it following islam in total it will surely be very good for dai to live in now coming back to the to the answer why do i say that malaysia is the best amongst the available muslim country i'll give merit at least for me it is and according to me even for most of the muslims if not 100% but for majority of the muslims malaysia would be the best number 1 is that in malaysia the federal religion of this country is islam yes amongst the 57 majority muslim country islam is not the religion of the country many countries they are muslim majority country but they are secular most of the big countries <laughs> that are the maximum population they are called as secular countries whether that be indonesia whether that be bangladesh indonesia is maximum among the muslim country maximum population bangladesh has number 3 population but they are based on the secular principle they are not called as muslim country though they may be majority muslim country but they don't follow the islamic sharia etc so number 1 in malaysia the federal religion is islam number 1 now among the 57 muslim majority countries all don't say that islam is followed and those who say also may not be following islam it may be for him say let's not go into the details i don't want to talk about the other countries i may not talk about malaysia so number 1 Islam is the federal religion is the religion of the country. Number 2 the government itself in Malaysia mashallah promotes most of the islamic activities. For example here the economic system there is the option that you can have jo there is a sharia court there is a normal court also. In economics in the finance you have the conventional bank you also have the islamic bank. 
And Alhamdulillah, Malaysia is number two in the world in terms of Islamic finance, in terms of volume, Alhamdulillah. So the population is not very big, it's hardly about 32 million. But it is Sharia compliant. The mosque you find are managed by the government very well, it's taken care of very well. So here, the Islamic activities, mashallah, are promoted by the government. The Sharia courts are there, the Sharia Islamic banking is there, Sharia finance is there, you'll find Sharia insurance, where in some majority Muslim countries, though it's a Muslim majority country, you will not find it. So there is Thakaful, mashallah. Then there is, by the government itself, there is a Dawa organization, the Islamic organization, they support that. From the income tax, the individual person, when he's giving zakat, if he gives zakat to, uh, to an organization which is certified by the government, you need not pay income tax. I mean, the income tax value, if you give a zakat, for example, if I'm earning a few hundred thousand dollars, I have supposed to give 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars, I have to give as income tax. If I give that to a zakat organization as an individual tax, that is accepted, I don't have to pay income tax additional. Alhamdulillah. If it's a company, there are some limitations. So the rules and regulation, there are Islamic Sharia courts, the normal court also. So the government promotes Islam. Amongst, I cannot say that I've traveled to all the Muslim countries. I have traveled to, Alhamdulillah, maybe 50, 60 countries, out of which maybe 40, 35 to 40 may be Muslims. So I don't claim I visited all the Muslim countries, but I visited most of the Muslim countries. And those which I have not visited, I try and find out the rules and regulation. Whatever I have in my limited knowledge, I would say Malaysia is the best available. Number three, the third reason, the first is the religion, is federal religion. Number two, the government supports in various ways, halal activities, halal food, everything. Number three, Malaysian amongst the non-Arabs, I would say the practice of Islam is very high. In Arab countries, in the Gulf countries, of course, I'm not comparing that. But amongst the non-Arab countries or the non-Gulf countries, like Muslims in India, in Pakistan, in Malaysia, I would say an average Malaysian is the more practicing Muslim than an average Muslim living in India or an average Muslim living in Pakistan or an average Muslim living in Bangladesh. I myself am an Indian. But on average, an average Malaysian here offers the percentage of Muslims in Malaysia offering five times Salah in the mosque is much more than the percentage of Muslims offering in India or Pakistan or Bangladesh. And I can go on. So an average Malaysian is more aware of his deen than an average Muslim in India or Pakistan or in Bangladesh. So the practice of Islam and an average Muslim in Malaysia is much higher than an average Muslim in a non-Arab country. I'm not talking about the Gulf countries or the Arab countries, we're much natural. There are some Arab countries, the Tawheed is very high and the practice is very high. The Salah is much higher, Alhamdulillah, from the non-Arab countries. Number fourth, the reason is that Malaysia is not directly under the control of any Western countries. Unfortunately, most of the Muslim majority countries, they are directly or indirectly controlled by the Western countries, whether it be America or whether it be some other Western countries. They are indebted to them or other non-Muslim countries. Most, not 100%, but majority among the 57 countries, which are majority Muslim, they are under control, direct or indirect, of a Western country or non-Muslim country. But Malaysia, alhamdulillah, is not under the control of any, any other non-Muslim country, mashallah. And plus, physically also, it is away from the war zone. So the Gulf is the war zone, war is in Yemen, taking place in Syria, or there. So it is away from the Western country physically, it's away from the war zone, therefore it is much safer. That is the fourth point. Fifth point, economically Malaysia is strong. Though it's called as a developing country, I consider it already developed. It is strong, it has got good economics, it has got a good budget, good income of petrol, etc. 
it is strong economically number five number six the passport of malaysia amongst the muslim majority countries it is the highest in world ranking it is the 14th according to the henley passport index a malaysian a malaysian citizen who has a malaysian passport can travel to 178 countries without visa in southeast asia it is second highest after singapore among the muslim majority country it is the highest in the world there is no muslim majority country which has as strong passport as malaysia so the malaysian citizen according to the hensley report as on 6th october the index keeps on changing every month and weeks it changes as on the 6th of october 2020 a malaysian a person holding a malaysian passport could travel to 178 178 countries without visa somewhere visa is not a required visa on arrival all these are 178 countries the highest in the world the highest passport is japan where a japanese can travel to 191 countries without visa number 2 is singapore which is 190 countries number 3 is germany which is 189 countries usa uk it is 185 countries malaysia 178 countries means compared to usa and uk seven countries less maybe you may not want to go to the seven countries so the passport is very strong all the other muslim countries are much less then will come brunei maybe 165 countries then will be uae it was 125 now i don't know the latest one then is turkey so most of except for four or five countries muslim majority countries or six may be having more than 100 countries most of more than 50 of the muslim majority countries you can travel to less than 100 countries this is the situation alhamdulillah malaysia is number 1 it is higher than many of the other non muslim countries also it is the 14th rank that is the sixth point Seventh point that mashallah malaysia is a beautiful country and very good scenery wise greenery is there beaches is there it's i think 10th country for tourism beautiful country mashallah and sea is there the greenery is there throughout malaysia it's beautiful the eighth point living here is cheap the index of living is cheap here and practically living also i have been living here for mashallah about more than 4 years now if i compare to city of bombay and where i'm living in putrajaya it's almost the same or i would say value is same but the quality is better here so living here compared to western countries very cheap compared to gulf countries very cheap it may be in the middle level it may not be as cheap as african countries but the quality is very good the quality of food the quality of fruit the quality of living the real estate is cheap compared to bombay it is very cheap so if you compare it is with a less money you can live a much more luxurious life in malaysia that is point number 8 point number 9 is that malaysia in terms of crime certain cities are very high certain cities but cities in which muslims are more than 85% is very low so cities in which the muslims are more in majority if the muslims are less then the crime is high i don't want to go into the details but other cities like where i'm staying in putrajaya it is negligible but kuala lumpur the crime rate is very high penang the crime rate is very high it may be one of the highest amongst among the asian countries but otherwise in the other parts like putrajaya or the other muslim majority place like uh, can be klantan can taranganu perlis keda it is low point number 10 10th point is that 
there are chances, high chances of doing dawa because the Muslims are approximately two third in Malaysia. The statistics that were last done more than a couple of decades earlier was 61.3 percent, but now I believe it may have gone to 64, 65 percent of the of the population of Malaysia are Muslims. The last government record says 61.3 percent, but that was I think 15 years back. But now it has increased, inshallah. So there's a good opportunity for a person to dawa, where one third of the population are non-Muslim. Number 11, the 11th point is that the facility given by the government to its citizen is excellent. Though many of the Malaysians aren't happy, maybe they haven't seen the world, but the hospitals are good. The facility, the free treatment that is given in the government hospitals are fantastic. There are many Malaysians who complain to me, I said, you have not seen the government hospitals outside in the world. I would say, Master Putrajaya, the government hospital is excellent. I would say, as far as the government hospitals are then Putrajaya, it would be better than 75% of the private hospitals in India. Even in Bombay. Bombay is a very rich city. It's a very strong city. Even in Bombay, the government hospitals of Putrajaya, especially the Putrajaya hospital, it's a special hospital, it is better than 75% of the private hospitals in India or, or even in Bombay. So the facility given by the government here is very good. And the twelfth, as the questioner asks, that a place where our children can be bought with the values. Here, Alhamdulillah, in Malaysia, we have got many Islamic schools. Alhamdulillah. In most, the whole of Malaysia, even the government schools are Islamic, mashallah, but otherwise they have got many Islamic international schools in different parts of Malaysia. And especially in Putrajaya, where I am staying, and I would say in Malaysia, it is preferable to stay in a city or a place which has majority Muslims or Muslims more than 85%, like maybe Klantan, maybe Tarangano, Cheda, Perlis, and amongst all, a blend of everything, I would say number one is Putrajaya. Why Putrajaya? Putrajaya is a modern city. It's a new city which was built about 25 years back. It was carved from a forest. And mashallah, it's a very well-managed city, very clean city. More than 90 to 95% of the population of Putrajaya are Muslims. It's an administrative capital of Malaysia. Kuala Lumpur is the capital of Malaysia. Putrajaya is the administrative capital where most of the ministries, the Prime Minister's office, most of the, except for one or two ministries are in Kuala Lumpur, majority are in Malaysia. It's a safe city, the crime rate is very low. And here, mashallah, in Putrajaya, there is, mashallah, no alcohol, no pork, mashallah, crime rate is negligible. So, alhamdulillah, it is a very good city. So, I would say, one of the best places in the world would be Malaysia and especially Putrajaya. Where the cost of living is low, it's a modern city, internet is very high, you can do dawa very well. So for me, it is the best place. And for most of the Muslims also, it is one of the best places that a person can live. There can be other places in some parts of the Muslim country where one particular city where a person wants to live there and not interfere with the rest of the world, it may be better. Allah alam. And Generally, I would say the best, but it's not easy to get citizenship. What you can do is you can apply for MM2H, that is Malaysia, my second home. Malaysia, my second home is a program which is bought by the government to encourage the foreigners to come and stay here, mainly after retirement or even before retirement. What you have to do is you have to invest 300,000 ringgit here, invest or keep it in an Islamic bank or and after one year, you can remove 50% of it. And the balance 50% should continue till the end of, end of the 10 years. Then you get a 10 years visa where you can come and stay with your complete family. It's called Malaysia, my second home. So if you just invest 300,000, 300, that's about $75,000 US dollars. After one year, you can remove half of it, 150,000 ringgit. That is $37,500 you can remove and the balance remains for the next nine years. You get a full, full family gets Malaysia, my second home. 
you can buy a property here it depends upon you in this way mashallah after 10 years again you can renew it lately just a few months back because of covid 19 this program has been discontinued inshallah very shortly it will start again so this is one way that if you want to live in malaysia you can come on that visa of malaysia my second home and a muslim mashallah stay i would say the best amongst all the places available but naturally after the harma in makkah and madina i would say malaysia and one of the best place in malaysia it is putrajaya and we have run out of time so that was the last question i could answer until we meet next saturday for the program ask dr zakir naik same time 11 30 malaysia 6 30 makkah time 3 30 gmt till we meet next saturday Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh wa akhiru dawana alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin